Okay, so the problem we have today is uh, we have this function, this indicator function, f of x equals zero if x is equal, uh, not equal to one, and one if x is equal to one. And we need to show that this is integrable on the closed interval uh, from zero to two. So uh, maybe we'll start by recalling what it means for a function to be integrable. There are a few equivalent definitions uh, of this concept, but what, what we mean by it is uh, if we take the closed interval from zero to two and we divide it into equal subintervals, n equal subintervals, uh, and then we look at this Riemann sum. We look at the sum from one to n of the height of the function taken at any sample point inside each of the subintervals multiplied by the width of the subintervals. Uh, if we take the limit of this as n approaches infinity, as the number of subintervals approaches infinity, or equivalently as the the size of the width of the subintervals gets smaller and smaller and smaller. We need to show that this limit exists and is unique. So does this limit exist? And is it unique? Uh, for all choices, xi star. Right, so as we take the limit as the number of subintervals increases, no matter how we pick the sample points inside each of the subintervals, does this limit exist and is it the same every time? Well, let's put something just kind of in a, let's, let's have a parenthetical aside here where we just look at the function and, and, and think about this because I think we can actually prove something uh, stronger. So this, this function, we're going to define it on the interval from zero to two and it takes on the value one um, let me use a different color. It takes on the value one once, in particular at one. Everywhere else, it takes on the value zero. So the function lives down here, except at this one value, it jumps up to one. And we want to ask, uh, do, does the limit of the Riemann sums exist and is it unique no matter how uh, or as we, as we divide up this, uh, sub, this interval into subintervals and let the number of subintervals go to infinity. And I, I think we can claim that it is. In fact, I think we can claim that this limit is going to be equal to zero for all choices of our sample points. The, the reason why is it just jumps up at this one point. And so anything that makes the sum here deviate from zero is going to take place in this very small neighborhood around one. So I think we can actually claim that this is equal to zero. And we can prove that it's equal to zero by making the subinterval small enough that the contribution, the possible contribution from the subinterval including the point one is negligible. Okay. So in, in, in principle or in essence we've actually proven this. But uh, so all, all it remains to do is to formalize it. I mean, of course, the formalization is tricky. So, we claim this limit exists. We claim it is equal to zero. Okay, now what does that mean? Well, it means, is this thing, is this sum, is this object, arbitrarily close to zero provided n is sufficiently large? So. Is this thing arbitrarily close to zero, provided n is sufficiently large? And this is just a straight up definition of a limit from first term. I claim it is. Let's see how we can prove that. So the first thing to notice is that these are not really material, right? Our, the size of our interval is two, it's from zero to two. If we divide it into n equal parts, each of those parts is gonna have width two over n. So let's note first of all that this guy is in fact equal to two over n times the sum. So the real question is, what is this guy? Well, as we saw in our picture, this is equal to zero. 
if the only choices of your sample points are points that are not equal to one. Right? So we can in fact say that f of xi star is equal to zero uh, in all cases except possibly two. And what are those two? Well, the subintervals that include the point one. So f of xi star is equal to zero in all cases except uh, when the subinterval includes the x value one. Right. So if you, uh, if I draw a picture on the side, what I mean by that is, all right. So here's one. If I take a subinterval, if I have a subinterval here, all of my choices of sample points are going to give me a height of zero. It's only if I have a subinterval that looks, say, like that, I have a infinite number of sample points that will give me a height of 0, and I have one sample point that's going to give me a height of 1. Okay, so this is almost always 0. So from this observation, we can conclude that this sum Well, what is that equal to? It might be equal to 0. It might be equal to 0 if in the subintervals, including the x value 1, we pick a sample point that's not 1. Or it might be equal to 2 over n. If in a subinterval, including the x value 1, we pick the sample point 1. And so we get one uh, positive term here, which gives us a, a total contribution of 2 over n. All of the other contributions are 0. Or, and this one's a, a bit of a subtle point, it could actually be 4 over n. But it could be 4 over, uh, so imagine that we have two subintervals that are uh, side by side, and the endpoint of, uh, so the right endpoint of one and the left endpoint of the other is 1. If that's the case, then we could uh, conceivably pick a sample point, a sample x value of 1 for two subintervals. And in that case, we would get two contributions of 2 over n and a total contribution of 4 over n. But it doesn't matter, because we can now see that in all three of these cases, in all three possibilities, 0, 2 over n, or 4 over n, uh, these are very clearly arbitrarily close to 0, provided n is sufficiently large. So I'm going to write all three possibilities are arbitrarily close to 0. provided n is sufficiently large. And that proves the claim. It proves that this function is not only integrable on the interval 0, 2, but that its integral is equal to 0. Uh, now, just to, we're, we're not going to do this here, but just to push it in a couple of different directions, one might ask, so what if we use one of the alternate definitions of integrability? Right? So what if we allow subintervals that are of different length, but their minimum length heads to zero? Can we do the same thing? Can we make the same analysis, use the same tricks? Or what if we use that third uh, alternative definition uh, of integrability where we take either equal or, or unequal subintervals and we look at the highest possible uh, Riemann sums, uh, the largest possible Riemann sums, the lowest possible Riemann sums, and we see if, uh, as the number of subintervals heads to infinity, if those two sums uh, converge. Can we make the same analysis? Can we do the same trick? And it turns out that in each of these cases, uh, this analysis still works. It's easier in some cases than in the other, and this just kind of demonstrates the, the appropriateness, maybe, of, of one definition of integrability uh, over other equivalent definitions uh, of integrability. <laughs>